I'm not going back for it. I'm grateful for the songs we sing. They're songs of joy, truly. Uh, they're songs that put our minds on Christ. I'm thankful for a church that loves to sing songs that are scriptural, that are based in truth. I'm grateful to be the church with you guys. If you have your Bibles, open with me to the book of First Timothy. It's really a letter. The letter of First Timothy. We are in our second week in First Timothy. We're calling the series Foundations. We want to be a church that has a firm foundation. We want to have a sound foundation as we follow after Jesus together. So what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, Paul wrote a letter to a young guy named Timothy who was helping start a church. And he said, hey, this is what it should look like. Here, go do these things. And it would make a lot of sense if we're looking at what, was, what is a solid church, what does a sound church look like, a healthy church, that we would look to this letter to Timothy. So we're going to be in verses 12 through 20. We're going to get right into it. Let's read this passage, and then we'll pray together. Verses 12 through 20, 1 Timothy chapter 1. This is what God's Word says. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though Formerly, formerly, I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as uh, that as in me, as of the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith in uh, faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hermanius and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you show us incredible grace that you show us incredible mercy, that we could claim, like Paul, that we are the foremost of sinners. God, we know our sin. You know our sin, and still you have forgiven us. I'm so thankful for that truth, that by your blood we can be redeemed. God, thank you for that. Help us to look to your word this morning, to grow in our affection for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a neat day in the life of our church because the church that we have sent out, Truth Bible Church, is meeting together for the first time today. I don't know if this picture worked. Did this picture come through? Uh, their, their picture's a little different. Um, oh, it may not have worked out. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll post the picture later uh, on, our, on our socials. But basically, they're in a garage today, <laughs> meeting with some metal chairs, uh, and I think it's pretty amazing. So they're getting started. They'll be this summer kind of gaining traction, and then they'll plan to launch in the fall. But that's not stopping them from already being invitational, inviting people in their neighborhoods and communities. So I'm encouraged by their faithfulness in church. I'm encouraged by your faithfulness. I know that uh, as we're in our fourth year, we're four and a half years old, that uh, we continue to have that mindset of being invitational and reaching our community. So I'm grateful for that. But as we look here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, uh, let me give you maybe a main idea that we can take through this passage today. And that's that God provides for his praise. God provides for his praise. Here's a thing that is true for all of us, that we provide for the things that matter the most to us. Think about that. We provide for the things that matter the most to us. So like for me, there's a reason my car has eight seats and sadly eight cylinders even though the gas pump is miserable, is because I want to be able to transport, transport all my kids at one time, right? Like we can't do that now because uh, we've been fruitful and multiplied. So we have to have this big car. So we provide for our kids to get around in one place uh, all together. So uh, we might see that with cars. You might see that with sports, the, that I want my kids to play sports. So we provide time in our week for that. You might see that in, hey, we need 
food so I work a job so I can put food on the table. Or, or we, we go to the grocery store so that our pantries aren't empty. So we provide for the things that matter the most to us. And for all of us, there's things that we don't do that we might think would be fun or we see other people doing is like, that, that would be nice, that we could do, but they just don't matter the most to us. And so, so we cut it out. We don't do those things. And that's not necessarily bad for any of what we're doing, but God does that. God provides for what matters to him. He, he, he provides for his praise. He provides for his worship. He's going to be praised even if it's the very stones that would cry out. Even if, even if the disciples stopped crying out his praises, even if his followers stopped crying out his praises, he told the Pharisees, if they stop, the rocks will start crying out. He's going to provide for his praise. In this case, here in 1 Timothy, God's provide, God provides for his praise. We're going to see through four different people, and we're going to see three different ways for how he provides. We're going to see Paul, Timothy, Hymenaeus, and Alexander. All of these guys, God's going to get his praise. How does that look? Well, here, look at verse 12 again with me. Verse 12, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. So just a couple of things. An outline, and in this outline today, we're just moving through the text. So a couple of words that come up in this, in this outline, in this text. Judged and appointed. Here at the first, he, he says, he judged me and appointed me. He judged me faithful. Jesus judged him and found him faithful. But Paul isn't boasting here. He's not coming to him and saying, I did so good. I scored so good on my SAT that God chose me. It's not that he got into Harvard, so God chose him. That's, that's not the issue here. That's not what he's boasting. He's really about to tell us all the ways that he shouldn't have been found faithful. But what the evidence is, is that Paul's faithfulness is actually evidence of God's faithfulness. Paul's faithfulness is actually evidence of God's faithfulness. God chose Paul for this service as an apostle. So God judged him and found him faithful because God had a plan for him. God chose him, not on Paul's merit, but on God's mercy. Right? Paul as an apostle was not a merit-based selection. It was a mercy-based selection. Paul didn't deserve this. Paul shouldn't have had this role. There, we could have chosen a thousand other men who probably deserved this more, but God, for his glory, chose Paul. It was mercy. Paul says, he appointed him to his service. That's, that's a great comfort to Paul. You've got to imagine as he writes this, that Paul takes great comfort in God choosing him, that he's appointed by God. You could imagine Paul having, and even from what he's about to say, what we can see in other letters, like even as we're going to see in Acts or in Romans, but you can imagine days where Paul had imposter syndrome. Maybe I shouldn't have been this guy. We know for a fact that the churches he was writing to, there were people who had questions, should we even be listening to Paul? So Paul puts this defense out there. Yeah, God has called me to this. He takes comfort in that God has called him. It's a great comfort to a man who's been abused and beaten and chased out of cities for carrying this message. Look, this is a message that I must take because I was appointed to take this message. I have no choice. This is what God has called me to. God appointed him to this task. And because God appointed him, God gave him strength to carry out the service. So, Paul says, look, God's given me strength. That's what you see right there in verse 12. I thank him. How does he describe God? Who is he thanking? He's thanking the one who has given me strength. God provided strength for Paul for his glory. What, is, what does Paul do with the strength that's been provided for him? He praises God. He turns around with worship. I thank God. So God provides for his praise here through choosing Paul, by appointing Paul to this work. I thank him who has given me strength. The purpose of Paul's strength, the purpose of God giving Paul strength wasn't Paul's satisfaction. It wasn't Paul's self-actualization. It wasn't Paul's self-identity. It wasn't Paul's desires or his life dreams. The purpose of strength was to accomplish the task God gave Paul. And that was, that was to make others right worshipers. 
is to make disciples, to make others who, to help lead others to follow Jesus. That was the purpose. Paul recognizes that purpose, the task that God gave him, and he responds in thanks. God, thank you for this. God, thank you for, I thank the one who brought me in, who allows me to participate. As you read this part of the letter, this is just a beautiful part of First Timothy. This is a, a good, man, this is the stuff we should enjoy. I mean, the whole Bible, we should, we should go through and enjoy. But there's some places in the, in the text that are just easier to consume and just let consume us. And here's one, this, this part of the text. Paul is thanking God, but it's not just surface level thanks. It's not like the guy who gets up for the Academy Award and is like, I want to thank all these. This is, it's meaningful his heart is here. His, his life is here. He breathes this. It, it's not surface level. As you read this part of the letter, it's easy to see that God is stirring Paul's affections even in this moment. Truly giving thanks. And when you give thanks, it's not, it's not just words, but you set your mind on it. Right? When, I, when we give true thanks, we're considering what has been done that we're thankful for. We're putting our mind on the person. We're putting our mind on their work. And that's what Paul's doing here. He's setting his mind on the person and work of God. So God provides for his own praise by calling Paul as an apostle. It's a special calling. It's a special, it's a special appointment over Paul. But I wonder how God has provided for his praise in your life. What has God called you to? So none of you will be apostles as Paul was, but what has he called you to? I mean, Paul could have easily, you look at Paul's life and Paul could have easily looked at his station in life and, and really felt frustration. Why did God put me in the place where I've got to go to towns and get stoned? Like, why did God do this to me? Couldn't he have given me the easier path? He could have felt frustration. He maybe felt boredom. I've had to sit in prison cells so many nights. Like, I wish I could be going and doing something that I enjoy. Right? Can't you imagine these complaints? This isn't far-fetched. This, would, this is possible that he could have felt this way, but he didn't feel this way. He could have covered, coveted his neighbors having more free time or living more of their dream or making more money or having the better relationship or having a romantic relationship at all. but Paul recognized his position as an appointment from God. God has appointed me to this. Now again, Paul's appointment was special, but we have every reason to believe that we've also been appointed. If, if you're a follower of Christ, if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, we should begin to see our lives in light of that appointment. I mean, Colossians 3, it doesn't get more clear than this for you, for every believer, whatever you do, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart so that you can get a raise, so that people will like you, so that you can have a more comfortable life, so that people will remember you after you die. No, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, as one who has been appointed to the Lord's work. Whatever you do, whoever you are, following Christ, work for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a, uh, as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. That's crucial in our lives. Paul got it. Paul taught it. Paul was leading Timothy in this thought process. We're gonna see him continue to lead Timothy in this process. And now in Galatians, God's giving that for us. Look, you have been called, you've been appointed. Do the work at hand for my glory. So you don't go to work to make money. You, you go to work to glorify God. That should change the way we walk into the doors in the morning. So we don't get home in the afternoon to just veg out. We get home in the afternoon for the glory of God. And maybe that is rest. But maybe dads, that's getting on the floor and playing with your kids, even though you're dead tired. And I'm just preaching to myself. <laughs> <laughs> 
maybe that's cooking dinner for your wife, or maybe that's cooking dinner for your husband. Maybe that's looking for ways to serve others instead of trying to find ways to be served because you recognize that in every moment you're working as unto the Lord. Changes the way that we go to work. I, I think you don't go to the grocery store to get groceries. If you're considered that, the main reason that you pull into Food Lion, Christian, is not to pick up that delicious pork shoulder that you're going to slow roast later. It's not the reason. The primary reason, okay, it's a reason. The primary reason is for the glory of God. You are opening your door, grabbing a buggy, walking into that place for the glory of God. Grabbing the pork shoulder is just a part of it. Grabbing your milk is just a part of it. But that changes the way you walk into a grocery store, doesn't it? Doesn't that change the way you walk to your kid's baseball game? Doesn't that change the way that you walk into your locker room? Doesn't that way change the way you walk into your classroom? It's for the glory of God. Because you've been appointed, your life is for the glory of God. Everything you do, every moment of your day is for the glory of God. For Paul, this is possible. He recognizes, he gives thanks for this because of what comes next, mercy and grace. He recognizes that because of mercy and grace, he has this appointment. This is what he says. Verse 13, look with me in verse 13. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent. Those are not words I like to use about myself. Here he is. But I received mercy he recognized it. Look, how, look who I was, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is really the heart of our passage today. This is the central just text of, of this prayer, this teaching he's given to Timothy. He's like, I give thanks to God. And it's almost like Paul gets lost in giving thanks. He forgets what he's doing for a second because he's just stream of conscious. Man, look how wonderful God is. I don't deserve this. I was this blasphemer. I was this persecutor. I was this insolent opponent. In Acts 2, Paul's standing in front of Agrippa and he says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but they, when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them and I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Paul, Paul is almost admitting here that we're not going to understand how bad he is. I was this guy. I was a bad person. But it was because he was bad that the next sentence is possible. I was formerly blasphemer, persecutor, insolent opponent, but I received mercy. There's no mercy for the perfect person. What, what mercy does the perfect one need? Paul needed mercy. And God gave it to him. You can't receive mercy if you don't need it. And the truth is we all need it. Everyone sitting in this room, everyone not sitting in this room needs mercy. 
Paul says that he acted ignorantly in unbelief. And until the Holy Spirit enlightens us to truth, truly we are all ignorant in unbelief. But grace unveils truth. Grace unveils truth. That it's a gift that the Holy Spirit unveils truth to us, that we might read the word and be enlightened to what is true. So he says, grace overflowed. One translation I love, it says, grace was super abundant. We think of grace over our sin. So mercy and grace, those are all things about what we deserve. I, I, I like the definitions of mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. So that's in the positives. <laughs> And this super abundant grace is almost like you ever done dishes in your sink and you've got all this like nasty kind of leftover food residue in the bottom of your sink. And it's like, if you took just, if you tried to just with your spit, try to get it down the sink, you'd never do it. It would just never be enough. But you turn on your faucet and there's this water that it's just the super abundant amount of water. You're gonna, the sink gets clean because it's just this great flow of water. I think about in our lives, our, our, our sin is just so destructive in us. And we're like with our spit trying to get rid of it in our sins. Like really what we're doing is making it worse. That's more gross. Stop it. Stop spitting in your sink. But Christ is there with grace, opening the faucet. Super abundant grace that we could never accomplish on our own. That's his testimony, and truly that's the testimony of every believer. Every one of us can ascend to this testimony. In God's grace, Paul now can say that he has faith and love from Christ. It's Christ's faith and love. It's God's faith and love that now fills him through grace. Because of what God has done, because of what Christ has done for me, because of what overflowed to me, this faith and love that are in Christ are mine. That's, that's a wonderful truth for every Christian. That our relationship with Christ, the faith and love we have from Christ that's expressed to us, that we get to express back to him, is something we shouldn't take for granted, Christian. It's, it's like if I gave my kid money to buy me a present, right? I mean, that's the faith and love. God gives that to us for us to give back to him. And that's not for non-believers. They, they can't have that relationship with Christ that comes in salvation. Paul's saying it's because Christ saved me by grace that I know and experience this type of faith and love. Then really, verses 15, 16, and 17 are just rocket fuel for our affection. I mean, I, I, it is, I, I think we're sitting on the launching pad in one of Elon Musk's new rockets, and we read verses 15, 16, and 17, and we make it into the atmosphere just on this. Uh, someone said verse 15 is like the gospel micro. It's just in a sentence, the gospel in a sentence. Verse 15 says, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Man, that, what a truth to be quick to our lips, church. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. It's absurd. It's, it's an absurd statement. It's an absurd truth. The fact that that saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance feels like it can't be true. It's too good to be true. That's where there are pastors who would say this is like a scandal. Some theologians would call this the scandal of grace. I mean, shouldn't God have come to take the best with him? If God came to earth, isn't he looking for the best ones? The highest SAT scores. The ones who are almost like Jesus already without the gospel. 
Like the ones who already don't sin a whole lot. Like he's not the ones he should come for, but that's not what he did. He came into the world to save the sinners. Mercy and grace mean not getting what we deserve. So how can we be saved? If Jesus came to save sinners, how can we be saved? We, we have to recognize that we're sinners. So if you've been to VBS ever in your life, Vacation Bible School, we're like a Southern Baptist affiliated church. So we've, I've, been to, I've been to VBS like every year of my life. And it's always the ABCs of salvation. You have to admit that you're a sinner is where it starts. Look, there's a problem. You have to admit there's a problem. Paul starts there. Look, if he's given his testimony, he's saying, I was once this guy. There was a problem. There was sin. But it doesn't stay there. That's not, the, that's not the end of it. That's not the gospel. That's just the start of it. But we recognize we need saving. We need mercy. Paul had no problem admitting his sin. As Christians, we should have no problem admitting that we've, there's been sin. That even today that we fight that in the flesh. There should be no problem of that. I think there's a fear in us that we can't talk about this. We can't talk about sin either as saved people because we've got to be perfect or talking to those who aren't saved because it's going to feel judgmental. But, but here, sin is, not, sin is not something that we have to hide, hide from. We don't glorify sin, but we recognize that that's been where we were. That's where we have been. So we don't present this message from a place of superiority. Paul's not saying I'm better than you. In fact, he's saying the opposite. There's no judgment in this. I was the worst. But sin exists. We have to recognize that. Sin exists. We have sin, but. It's twice in this passage, but here, let's settle in on verse 16. But I was a sinner, the foremost. Verse 16, but I received mercy for this reason. I was lost in my sin. I was done for, but I received mercy. But God gave me mercy. One commentator said that you could really take that, that he received mercy as he was mercied. It, it, it was, it's passive. He didn't go gain it. He didn't go earn it, but God mercied him. But Why? Why did God, why did God mercy him? Why did God give him this great abundant mercy? Why was there super abundant grace here? Look at the text. So that Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. The mercy wasn't so that Paul could be great or that we might be talking about Paul today, the mercy was to put Christ's glory on display. It was to lift Jesus up. Look, let's display Jesus and his patience. Let's, let's look at his nature. Let's look at his goodness. Christ's mercy to Paul was for the display and honor and magnification of Jesus. It lifts Jesus high. So Jesus puts his own nature on display, not because Jesus is selfish, but because Jesus loves us. When Jesus displays himself to us, it's never out of arrogance. It's always out of love. If we knew what we needed, if we knew what was best for us, we would ask for more and more and more. Like Moses, we would say, show me your glory. And so Jesus in his kindness gives us displays. Here, here's perfect patience that you can see. Look at the super abundant grace that you can experience. Look, feel my mercy, you sinner. We can see him on display, who he is. So he displays it so we can be saved, so that we can glorify him, so that we can be caught up in his beauty and in his goodness. And God saves Paul for this reason, as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. God saves Paul so that others may believe, so that as we look at Matthew 28, that he might make disciples of all nations. That's the purpose. And that's your purpose in salvation too, Christian. 
That's the example for us as well, that we would follow in those footsteps that we would, in our lives, put Christ on display. Our salvation is never private. You don't get to be a Christian with private faith. You, you just, you don't. I, I don't know, I don't, I don't know, I don't have a clever way to say that. Your faith is meant to be public. Your faith, your faith is meant to be for others. I've said it in here before, but Galilee says your faith came to you. The gospel came to you to get to someone else. That is true. That's what we see here. That's what we see in Matthew 28. That's what we see in John 10. God has given us this commission. A private faith, I would argue, is no faith at all. A private faith is reminiscent of what Jesus would talk about, that if you deny If we deny the Father before men, what will the Father do to us? He'll deny us. Paul proves this in verse 17, this public faith, this this being enamored in a life given to God. Verse 17, it's this proclamation. It's It's like this outcry. He's thankful to what God has done. We see this gospel presentation, this short testimony in just a few verses here. And it's the summation. He says to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Maybe I shouldn't take this liberty, but I I will. I can imagine Paul sitting here writing this or, or transcribing it, speaking it to someone else. And he gets to verse 17 and just pauses for a second. He just imagines what God has done for him. He just imagines, he remembers the work of Christ in his life. And it's just this overwhelming worship and he launches into praise for who God is. He is, this is our God, the king of all time, ages and ages. He has no end. He is immortal. He's invisible. He's too good even for us to see. He's beyond us. He's not like us. He's the only one. There's no one else who is in comparison. And it's him alone who gets honor. And it's him alone who gets glory. Nothing else in our life should be in competition. For today, and for tomorrow, and forever. I will never be disappointed for all of my life to be for his honor and his glory. Amen. The gospel should elicit joy in us. The gospel, the joy of the gospel, the the joy that's elicited in us from the gospel should lead us to praise. It should lead us to this outward worship. It should lead us to evangelism. It should lead us to disciple making. This whole letter that Paul's writing is this drawn out. Paul isn't discipling Timothy and wanting the health of this church because it's all mundane and it's not real. It's because the truth and joy of the gospel compels him to see the church grow, to see the gospel go out. I love that when Paul thinks on what God has done, his heart erupts into praise. What what an image. Not only is God perfectly patient and willing to save sinners, he's immortal, he's invisible, he's the only God. Romans 11.33. I love how here, again, same same author, genuinely the same author because it's all God-breathed. It's all the word of God. Romans 11.33, all the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways. We should be a people that know the word because out of the word, we have words to praise back to him. So we've seen this mercy and grace that draws Paul into this amazing moment of praise and worship. But then this last part, 
It's in this. This is the context of that moment of praise. It's kind of, it's kind of strange when you look at it overall, but here's a man enamored with Christ. He kind of gets back on topic in verse 18. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, he's saying by rejecting this, he, he's, he's referring to this charge. He's, he's referring, referring to verse 15, this, this gospel. He, he's referring to the holding faith in verse 19 and good conscience in verse 19. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Manius and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. This charge, I entrust you. There's a ton here. We don't have time to hit all of this in the depth that maybe I would like to, but the charge I entrust you, God provides for his praise through Timothy by calling him through the church. That's what happens here. Paul's reminding him, look, there, you, you have, there's the prophecies that have previously been made about you. Hold on to those. Be encouraged by those prophecies that, that these men, these prophets, that me as an apostle, these prophets here in the early church, we've, we've said this. This is God's word to you, that you have been called to this. So Paul and the prophets have called, this, called him to this charge, to take on what Paul is entrusting him to, to lead the church, to pastor the church, to shepherd the church. So God provides for his praise that way provides through this charge. He says, look, you need now, Timothy, to take this message that Christ came into the world to save sinners. You need to build your church on this message. Be this, be this pastor. He says the same thing in 2 Timothy 2. He says, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, now it's your turn. Entrust this to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So in 1 Timothy, he says, I'm entrusting this to you. In 2 Timothy, he says, now you entrust it to others. It's the Christian life. It's reproduction. It's making disciples. This is what we do. This is what God has called us to. And what we see is when men forget this, when men drop what God has called them to, then they make shipwreck of their faith. What, what an incredible and sad moment. Paul reminds them, look, this, you're, you're at war. This is not a small thing. You're at war. Wage the good warfare, he says. Ephesians 6, he reminds us, we're not wrestling against just mean people in the world. We're wrestling against f not flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And we're not going to wage war like that by being stronger than the next guy or having our political party in charge. We're going to wage war like that when we do what Ephesians 6 commands us to do and we put on the armor of Christ, the armor of God, the whole armor. I'm not going to go through the whole armor right now, but just I want to quickly say there's some of us trying to wage good warfare who have no idea where our swords are. Some of us are at war and we haven't picked up our sword in weeks. You look at Ephesians 6 and the sword of the Spirit is God's word. I, think that, I look at my life, I imagine that some of you have the same experience, but it's like we forget that we're at war. I mean, could you imagine if right now there was a war going on in Fairview, Monroe, Stallings, wherever you live, like at any moment your house might have the next rocket go through it. You wouldn't forget. You'd care for your family. You would do what you need. You'd keep your windows boarded up. You'd put the armor up. You'd have your guns ready. But here we're in a true war. It, it's not, this isn't figurative. Truly, in the spiritual realms, there is a war. And here we are. So I would say, what about your family? How, are you protecting? Do you have any thought of where your family's at in this war? I, I want to I show you this. If you don't know about this, this is our at-home worship journal. It's just a way, it's really just a way to help keep accountability for are you, are you and your family worshiping together? Are you, are you engaging in the war together? These are out at the connection point. If you want one, I'd love for you to have it. It's got some scripture memory. It's, it's really easy. But I think parents... Man, an easy question I would ask you is, do you know where your kids are reading in their Bible right now? I think it's a great question for us. If you're like, well, I don't have kids. 
that's fine. Like, I, this isn't exclusive to families. Families have an ex, a, a really important role in this. But if you don't have kids, there's a role for you to play. There's other people who don't have kids who need accountability. Parents need help. Parents, is that right? Do parents need help? Yeah. We're in this together. As a church, we're in this together, fighting this war together. And that war is following after Christ. Some forget the war, some turn from Christ. Hymenaeus and Alexander. But even in this, God provides for his praise. Even when they shipwreck their faith and they're turned over to Satan, the goal is that they may learn not to blaspheme. All discipline is unpleasant at the moment, but God disciplines his children to lead us back to him. That's the goal. The goal in this isn't just anger at, this, at these two guys. It's to bring them back. I think a rebellious child looks at the loving discipline of their father with anger and hatred. Why are you doing this to me? But a loving child looks in thankfulness and submission. Thank you for bringing me back. God, thank you for helping me see you and love you. Paul has that hope for Hymenaeus and Alexander, that they might be brought back to holding faith and a good conscience in Christ. I think when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper with his disciples, he desired that it would be a tool in this warfare that we wage to hold faith and have a good conscience. So we participate in communion in remembrance of him. Communion is meant to be that regular gift to the church to help draw us towards Jesus, to help us remember this gospel, to, to help us, to prevent us from rejecting faith as we examine ourselves. When Paul is teaching the Corinthian church about communion, he says this in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat the bread and drink of the cup for every, anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. You see that? That same type of heavy language here. Verse 32, but when we're judged by the Lord, we're disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then look, there's, this is heavy. Communion is heavy, but it's meant to draw us closer to Christ. So communion is not for you if you're perfect, because none of us would have it. But it's for us as we are repentant and as we draw near to Christ. This is the idea. It's the same idea that Paul was teaching Timothy. When we reject God, God disciplines his children to bring us back. He gives us tools. I hope that I'm one who's thankful for discipline but I don't want to experience it if I don't have to. I'd rather avoid it. And I think that's one of the gifts of the Lord's Supper is it helps us avoid that discipline as we keep drawing back and examining ourselves before God. So here's what we're going to do. In one second, I'm going to dismiss you to grab a cup and go back to your seat. And when you get back, we're going to take some time. I want to invite you to take time and examine yourselves. Maybe you haven't had any quiet time alone this week to just sit with God. I think what we get is a chance to just sit with God together for just a couple of minutes. So I'd like to invite you, come grab a cup. If, you, if you're like, I don't want to necessarily walk up there, someone can grab it for you. Uh, but if you're in the middle aisles, maybe come down to the middle table. If you're in the outside aisles, there's tables on the ends. So once you grab those and make your way back to your seat.